Hi everyone, welcome to week two of ECO 204. For this week, you're going to be reading chapters four, five, and six. We're going to be looking at elasticity and consumer choice and different types of market failures. When we look at elasticity, elasticity is going to be focusing on how consumers respond to the changes in the prices of goods and services. You'll notice the elasticity is a very important conversation because stores need to evaluate uh, how sensitive consumers are to different changes in the prices of goods and services. You notice that goods can either be elastic or inelastic. And when we look at elasticity, we're looking at this change in income over change in price. So we have to evaluate how the role of elasticity will influence many decisions that stores have to make with their prices and consumers have to make with regard to what they consider a very important good or not. So there's types of different types of elasticity. There's anyone, there's elastic or any goods that are less than one, the absolute value is less than one, it's said to be inelastic, which means that the change in quantity demanded is much less than the change in the price. So that means if a store decides to raise prices, 20% consumers might buy 15% less. So it wasn't as great of a change as expected. Then we have what's called elastic goods. An elastic good is when it's greater than one, the absolute value. And when we look at this, the larger the coefficient, the greater the responsiveness to elasticity. And then when we look at elasticity, we're going to look at it on a graph. And I think this will make it much easier to understand the role of graphs and where it should be evaluated at. This is classified as a perfectly inelastic demand curve, which means when there's a change in price, you'll notice that, you'll notice that, I'm sorry, when there's a change in price, you'll notice that uh, consumers will buy the exact same amount. That is perfectly inelastic, and that doesn't happen very often. Probably the best example that I can think of is when you look at uh, goods like, um, insulin or any required medicine that people have to take to survive. Now let's look at a perfectly elastic demand curve. When we look at a perfectly elastic demand curve, you'll notice that when there's a change in price, consumers will buy nothing of it. Because consumers can buy something else as a perfect substitute to it. So that would be perfectly elastic. And then we have unitary elastic or unit elastic, which means when there's a change in price, let's say the price goes up 15%, people buy 15% less. So the exact change in percentage will be both uh, in terms of percent, in terms of price and quantity. Now when you look at these demands, curves, you'll notice that there's going to be a different amount of elasticity depending on where you are at where you are at on the demand curve. That's very important to evaluate. There's a couple of different ways to calculate elasticity. Elasticity. The best way to use is the midpoint method. And the midpoint method will give you the most accurate way to calculate elasticity. And here's the midpoint math, method. Change in quantity. Add both quantities up, divide by 2, you get the percentage change here, and then the change in price, add both quant prices up, and divide by 2. When you do this, it will give you a little more accurate explanation to what is occurring. Now, factors affecting demand. One of the factors affecting demand is substitutes. When there are more substitutes available in the market, You'll notice that consumers have more choices, and when they have more choices, they're going to be wanting to buy more goods and services of that other product that they can choose. When there's more substitutes, goods can be more elastic because people don't have to buy that particular good. Another component of elasticity is time. When we look at time, the more time you have to shop, the more elastic a good will be. The less time you have to shop, the the more inelastic a good will be because you have to buy it at that point. <clears throat> now let's go to the utility maximization theory. Utility is looking at satisfaction from consuming a good or service. You notice that consumers have different utilities for different 
very for various goods and services that we evaluate. We're going to evaluate this based off the total utility and the marginal utility. Your total utility is the total satisfaction from consuming a good or service. Your marginal utility is the additional satisfaction from consuming a good or service. Now when we look at the figure, when we look at the principle of diminishing marginal utility, we're looking at our decreasing uh, utility from consuming a good or service. And we look at an example, let me show you this uh, graph right here. When we look at an example, let's say that you go and eat a piece of pizza at a restaurant and you get 20 utils of satisfaction from consuming that uh, pizza. Then you eat two slices of pizza, you get a total of 30 units of satisfaction. When you consume the first slice, that is only 20 units. Then when you consume the second slice, that is only 10 units. You'll notice that your utility has declined after the second one. You're still satisfied, but not as much as the second one. That is called the diminishing margin utility. And that concept's very important to evaluate. When we're trying to maximize total utility, we're trying to maximize where will consumers stop consuming based off of where they would like to consume at. And that's a very important concept to evaluate. Because what we're looking at with utility is how we can evaluate our utility based on this, our satisfaction from consuming a good A and good B and the prices that we're willing to charge. <clears throat> utility maximization is the process by which a consumer is going to adjust consumption. They're going to adjust consumption to gain the highest total amount of satisfaction. And when you gain consumption that way, you're going to have a lot of different challenges that you're going to focus on. Because we have to figure out how satisfied you are from consuming a good or service and what are the prices that you're willing to pay. There are problems with utility theory. There are two major problems. The first one is the same goods are not divisible. So we might not like the same goods at the same amounts. The second is it's very hard to measure utility. It's very hard to say what our satisfaction is from consuming a good or service. That's very important to, uh, to realize because it's hard to know what we want to consume or where we want to consume it. Now, when we look at shopping for bargains, you'll notice that con economists use this concept to analyze shopping behavior. The idea is that a buyer will search for bargains until there's savings or value or utility from searching. When there's many predictions that are made from this theory, the first is the larger amount of individuals expect to save. And then the longer they will, they'll continue to search. In other words, the bigger the item, or to, in terms of your budget, the more you'll shop around. The second prediction is the variation in prices of your budget. And this is a very difficult one to predict, because when we look at the variation, it's going to ask us to make a lot of different uh, projections in the market. Now let's go to chapter 6. When we look at chapter 6, we're going to be talking about a couple key terms. The first one is externalities. Externalities is the cost or benefit to consume a good or service. And you'll notice that externalities are present in the market whenever the government has to get involved to bring about a market decision. There's many problems caused by externalities. And, the, and one of the problems that we look at externalities is governments get involved to make different decisions. We have what's called positive externalities, and positive externalities are benefits to a third party, where negative externalities are a cost to a third party. You'll notice that the government has to get involved in both of those. And we look at an example of a positive externality, a good example of a positive externality would be, a, uh, would be education would be picking up trash. Those are all benefits to a third party. When we look at cost to an externality, you'll notice that when we look at cost, those would be smoking and drunk driving. Those are different instances where the government has to get involved to provide support in our economy. And the different support that they provide will bring about different challenges. So these are some of the concepts that we're looking at for this week. You want to be able to estimate the role of the government in the terms of how we make decisions in markets with externalities. 
Elasticities, we're looking at how consumers make decisions. And with utility, we're looking at how consumers make decisions as well in terms of their satisfaction from consuming good, goods or services. If you need any additional resources, please let me know. But I look forward to your effort this week.